Hey, this is Jamie with Stonemaier Games, and today I'm going to talk about my top 10 favorite hand management games. This was probably the most difficult list I've ever had to create because a lot of games use cards in hand. Um, and so I had to kind of figure out uh, what, what it really meant for a game to, to involve hand management. Um, and so here's the definition I came up with from a couple different sources and from kind of my own intuition, which is, okay, so a hand management game is a game where you play cards in certain sequences or groups where timing and order of operations matters, and you try to get the most value based on which cards you choose to play, keep, or discard. This sometimes includes multi-use cards, uh, ways to get more cards or to better craft your hand, um, avoiding getting stuck with certain cards in hand that maybe you don't want in your hand, um, and that your hand maybe matters at the end of the game, the cards that are actually in your, in your hand, or even throughout the game, the cards in your hand matter um, just as much as the cards that you're actually playing. So those are the, the requirements that I use for, for sculpting this list. Some honorable mentions, actually, and one of the reasons I'm making this video um, is that we are releasing Red Rising, the game. And Red Rising is a game that's inspired by another game on this list to a certain extent, um, but it uh, offers a, a, a new depth of choices, I would say, compared to this other game, this other game that I truly love. Um, but Red Rising is uh, through and through a hand management game. You are deciding throughout the game which cards you want to deploy on the board to remove from your hand and gaining the deployabilities at the right time. Um, versus which cards you want to keep in your hand because at the end of the game, the cards in your hand matter. Those are the, that's your crew of people, your, 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 the people that, you, that matter the most to you and that you'll score at the end of the game. Um, so this is why this, this uh, mechanism of hand management has been on my mind a lot lately because of, uh, of Red Rising. So um, some of the other games that I, we have a few other games at Stonemaier Games that, that use this mechanism. There's Viticulture. Uh, tapestry, Wingspan, and Pendulum all use various forms of hand management to varying degrees. And other um, honorable mentions include Res Arcana, Battlesca Battlestar Galactica, Ticket to Ride, Great Western Trail, Love Letter, Brass, Lewis and Clark, Downforce, Underwater Cities, Air, Land, and Sea, Hanabi, Kemet, Magic, and Keyforge. Almost in order of how close those games came to making the top 10. And uh, if they're not on the top 10, it's not, for some of those games, it's because I don't, maybe I don't like them as much as other games. For some of them, it's also, and this was the tough part, deciding, um, are these games technically hand management games? And if they, even if they are hand management games, is that such a core part of the game um, and an innovative part of, of the game that it belongs on the top 10 list? And so that was very difficult to figure out. So let's jump right in. This is probably the most difficult game to for me to figure out if it belonged on the list. And that's why it's at number 10 instead of being higher, because I really do enjoy this game. And that is Hierarchy. In Hierarchy, at the very beginning of the game, um, all cards in the deck are dealt to the two players. I don't think any cards are removed. I think they're all dealt to the two players. So it's a two-player game. All the cards are dealt. And the cards are double-sided. They have the same thing on both sides except a different color. So if I'm the purple player, I'll be looking at the purple side. If you're the green player, you'll look at the green side. Um, these cards are numbered, I believe, 1 through uh, 13. Let's see. Yeah, 1 through 13. And the entire point of the game is to play your cards on the table in such a way that the opponent cannot play a card. And there are a few rules that go along with that. Like, in general, you can only play a card with a higher number than the previous card. But then some of the cards break that rule. Um, but that's the general idea. And the reason it's a little bit lower on this list is because you are never gaining cards throughout the game. However, you are really, really managing your hand of cards because oftentimes you are playing a card and you are never seeing it again. And that might have a really big impact on the choices that you make throughout the game. And so you're trying to manage this hand of cards so that you don't get stuck, basically. Um, so that you can always, you always have a play, you have a way to play a card so that you can last a little bit longer in the game, outlast your opponent and prevent them from playing a card. I love this game. It's such a beautiful, elegant game. Um, and even though you aren't gaining new cards, which is really the only reason that it's lower on this list, and perhaps unfairly so, uh, you are managing this, this very tight hand of cards throughout the game in an effort to outlast your opponent. So that's why Hierarchy is my number nine, my number 10 game on this list. 
And number nine is a much bigger game, and that game is Root. Root is an asymmetric game. It's known mostly for its asymmetry, but it actually has a mechanism in the game uh, related to hand management that I like even more than the asymmetry. Um, and that is that all players are using a common deck of cards for their own asymmetric style of hand management. I, I think it's so impressive in Root that they distilled, instead of giving like every player their own deck of cards, they somehow distilled all these mechanisms down to a single deck um, that means, and those cards mean different things for different players. So every player essentially is playing their own little mini hand management game with these cards, even though it's a single deck of cards. It's a very simple deck of cards as well that all players are using. So I just think that's that's awesome and rude. That, that, and I can't even go into the different management, the way that players are managing their hand because every player is doing that differently. But just the fact that it all stems from a single deck of cards is incredible. And that's why Root is my number nine game on this list. And number eight is one of my more recent plays, and that is Luxor. Uh, this is a game that I've played really only on Board Game Arena, but it has a great implementation there. And in Luxor, the hook to the game is that you always have five cards in hand, and the only cards that you can play are one of the two cards on the exterior of your hand. So you always have to keep your cards in the same order in your hand, and you can only play the number one card and the number five card, those cards being the ones on the outside of your hand. And at the end of your hand, at the end of your turn, you are adding a card to the middle of your hand. So at the end of your turn, you'll have four cards in hand. So there's a clear middle slot and you draw a card and put a card into that slot so that you'd have five cards again. And I really like, it's almost a spatial hand management because you're trying, I know that if I pick the, the, the card on my far right and I play that, I know that the kind of the cards are going to slide over into that direction so that I, the next card I know I, I can play is either the card that slides into that slot or the card that, that I didn't play from the left side of my hand. And so you really are actively, literally managing your hand and this and it, the, your hand of cards throughout the game and from turn to turn so that you can set up plays for the little workers that you're trying to move around the board with the, that hand of cards. I think that's just really, really clever. Um, and it's, it's unique to the games on this list. And number seven on this list, uh, this is Luxor. Number seven on this list is kind of a similar mechanism, but a, a little differently done, and that is Bonanza by Uwe Rosenberg. In Bonanza, again, you the order of your cards in hand cannot change. They must stay in the same order. And this is a restriction that kind of makes the game because in Bonanza, you're trying to play uh, cards from your hand, and you, can always, you always must play from the same side. I don't know if the game says if, if it really matters, but you basically must always add cards to your hand on, I think it's the far left, and then play cards from the far right of your hand. And on your turn, you must play either one or two cards. Um, I hope I have that number right, but you must play at least one card. And you're trying to create sets in play for the cards that you have. And those sets turn into different values based on the type of bean. This is a game, of, a card, a game about bean cards. Um, and so, and so the, the thing that this restriction does, that you have to play a card and you have to play it from the same direction, um, is that it encourages trade between players. Because players are allowed to actively trade when it's their turn with other players. And... So you're trying to trade, uh, typically often when it's even not your turn, you're trying to trade with other players so that you can get to the cards in your hand that you actually want to get to, that you actually want to play. You're trying to get rid of other cards. And so the game is constantly, the game is basically really um, encouraging players to trade so they can improve their own state. And it often leads to players getting rid of cards that are almost objectively more valuable because of a certain card that they need to make a certain set that they have more and more valuable. And so the just that, that restriction, I love this restriction of making sure players can't change the order of cards in the hand and that they must play a card to open up that trading aspect of the game. That's why Bonanza is my number seven favorite uh, hand management game. At number six is a pair of games. I keep pairing games, these two games on these lists, but I love them for the same reasons, and so I need to put that... I, I've decided that I'm going to continue to combine them. And now those games are Concordia and Flotilla. Both of these games use nearly the exact same mechanism, which is that on your turn, you are taking a single card from your hand, you are playing it as the action, you're, you're doing the action on that card, and then that card goes into a discard pile. Uh, but it's not deck building, because... 
uh, at a certain point, you will decide to play one of those cards that says retrieve all the cards that you've played and get a benefit based on how many cards you are retrieving back into your hand. I think this is a brilliant mechanism on multiple levels. One of those levels is the fact that, that uh, the timing of when you pull cards back into your hand matters because you might get more resources based on um, exactly which card you're playing to get those cards back into hand. I also just love the simplicity of having all actions in the game immediately in front of you in your hand of cards. And so actually managing the order of actions that you play based because the actions are equal to the cards um, is a huge part of the game. And this is the game uh, for both of these games. When are you going to take actions um, and, uh, and, and in what order will you take them? And the game doesn't let you, like it could be overpowered in some games if you could just take the same action over and over again. Concordia and Flotilla don't let you do that because even if you have a really great card, after you play it, you have to wait to play a retrieve turn or play a retrieve action to get that card back into your hand. So at best, even if you have a super overpowered card in the game, you somehow manage to get it into your into your hand because you can't obtain new cards in these games. If you have a super overpowered card, the best you can do is to play it every other turn. Um, I, I love this. I, I, I absolutely just love this mechanism. And I think Concordia and Flotilla do a great job with it. And number five is Watergate. Watergate is uh, an asymmetric two-player tug-of-war game um, where players are using the cards in their hand to manipulate different tokens on a tug-of-war tra uh, track. Um, and every, every round feels like a countdown to the end of the round because what matters at the end of the round is that certain tokens are on your side of the track or maybe are on your opponent's side of the track. And so the cards that you play and the order you play them really, really matters. You gain all the cards that you have for that round at the beginning of your of your turn. And so the hand management is so tight in this game. You're, you're constantly looking at those cards determining, okay, which card should I play now? Which is better to play now? And which card is better for me to wait until later to play? Uh, that's a huge decision in this game, Watergate. So I love, I, I, even though like one of the stipulations I put on this list is that you are gaining new cards and you do gain new cards in Watergate. It's just not completely under your control. Um, you, you automatically draw them at the, at the beginning of the round. Um, I, I love that you are given this, uh, this hand of options and it's up to you to decide how to optimize that hand, exactly when is the right time to play those cards and, and when is the, the better time to hold onto them a little bit longer and wait till the end of the round to play them so maybe you can surprise your opponent. Um, and Watergate does one other thing with the tug of war that I think I need to mention, which is that if you get certain tokens to the end of the tracks, the very end of the tracks, I think it's typically it's uh, the end of your track in Watergate. It's been a little while since I played it, unfortunately. Um, if you get it to the end of the tracks, you immediately win that bonus. You gain that bonus. So that's a reason to maybe early in the round really push a token in one direction rather than waiting to a surprise opponent at the, an op your opponent at the end of the round because it's possible that you might just lock in that that token early on in the round. Oh, so even just talking about it makes me want to play Watergate. Such a great game. That's number five. And number four is a game that has some similarities to Watergate in some ways and that is Hanami Koji. Hanami Koji is another two-player game, another tug-of-war game, in fact, um, where you start with a, a pretty big hand of cards, and every at the end of every uh, round, you're going to draw a few... Uh, every, every turn, you're going to draw another card. Um, and there are only four actions that you take each round in Hanami Koji as you try to influence the geisha cards at the, at the table. And in Hanami Koji... Uh, the hand of cards, even though you are not uh, controlling which cards you gain, these are these are random cards that you're gaining at the end of the round, um, you're constantly trying to figure out, is now the right time to, uh, to take a certain action, and which cards do I devote to that action? I'll give you an example here, because I'm talking a little bit abstractly here. So, one of the actions you can take is pick three cards from your hand, and your opponent and, and play them and your opponent will pick one of those cards to play for themselves and you get to keep the other two cards and play them for yourself. Um, another one of the actions in the game is to remove two cards from your hand. Just de just delete them from the game. Get them out of the game or get them out of that round so that no one sees them so they can't impact any of the geisha at the table. And so the, these, even though a big part of the choice is the order in which you take these actions, which are not on the cards, these are the actions are tiles. The choice of which cards you choose to play for each of these actions and when you choose to play them and use them for each of these actions is 
such a, a, a juicy decision that you make in this game. Um, do you decide, like when I give that, when I present those three cards, do I present three of the same cards? My opponent doesn't really have a choice. Do I give them a really difficult decision? Maybe I, I and, and the information, and I have information in my hand. I have cards in my hand that they don't know about. So they might pick a, a certain card um, that will really benefit me. They might, or, or maybe it can't help me because of the card that they, they decide. It's just a, every decision in, in, in which cards that you're actually presenting um, to your opponent or which cards you're removing from the game, which card you're setting aside for, for, for yourself um, is, is, is a hand management decision in Hanami Koji. I just have so much fun with this game. That's why it's number four on this list. I'm going to dig through my pile a little bit here um, to get to my number three game, and that is Libertalia. Libertalia, again, is essentially hand management in the game. In Libertalia, you are all players are given the same um, nine pirate cards at the beginning of each round. So every, every player has the exact same nine cards. And the entire game is deciding exactly when you want to play those cards to optimize the benefits for you. Uh, basically, when you play a card, you play it simultaneously in Libertalia. They go on the ship in the game and in the order in which you, you play them. So if I choose a five ranked card, a card ranked number five, and you play the captain, you play the, the number 30 ranked card, my number five would go to the left and the captain higher ranked would go to the right of mine, my number five card on the ship. And they will activate those cards from left to right in terms of certain abilities that they have. And then from right to left in terms of other sets of abilities and, uh, and based on their ranking, they will choose which booty tiles or booty tokens they want to take from, uh, from the general supply of loot for associated with that day. And so there's, there's lots of decisions going on here. It's, it's, it's order of operations. You're trying to think which cards are my opponents going to play so that I can have my, uh, my pirates in the better order on the ship. It's which cards do I want to play right now based on the loot that's available, the booty tiles that are available. Um, and also there's this, the decision of which cards do I not want to play this round? Because even though at the beginning of rounds two and three, all players gain the same six cards, you get to carry over any cards that you didn't play in the previous round. And so this is another, this is a whole other level of hand management because even though every player is kind of getting those same cards, you're deciding, I want to hold off on these, usually three cards, and I want to save them for the next round so I can have an advantage over my opponents who maybe didn't keep these cards and I can maximize them based on when I play them. And that's another thing. At certain times in, in Libertalia, you might play a card that has a nighttime benefit, an evening benefit, which gives you a benefit every day of that round. And so you might really, you might try to play that card really early in the round, um, or you might wait to the next round and be the one to play it early in that round. Just so many decisions about the timing of when you play cards and which cards you keep. That's why Libertalia, and it's just such a fun game along with that. That's why it's my number three game on this list. My number two game was one that I debated including on this list or not, and that is Dune Imperium. The reason I debated this is because Dune Imperium is a deck building game. You are building a, a deck of cards in Dune Imperium. And I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to put Dune Imperium on this list, do I then need to consider all uh, deck building games to this list? But I don't think most deck building games are actually hand management games because in most deck building games, you get a hand of cards and you must play all of those cards. There is not really a choice into, in terms of what you're actually managing in your hand because your hand goes away at the end of the round. In Dune Imperium, that is the case, but there is a, a, another decision point in Dune Imperium that I think turns it into hand management. And that is, in Dune Imperium, you have a few worker meeples and you're basically playing a card and then placing a meeple somewhere on the board, worker placement style, based on the spaces that card opens up for that worker. Um, early on in the game, you only have two meeples and so you're spending two cards to do this. Uh, so there's a, a worker placement decision there that is not hand management. However, at the end of each round, you are going to take a turn where you simply play all cards in your hand, not for worker placement, but rather to gain the benefits at the bottom of those cards. And those benefits either um, impact the combat for that round, um, or they, they determine what you can buy, what new cards you can acquire that round. And so there is 
a really crucial hand management decision that you make every round in Dune Imperium, basically where you're deciding which cards do I want to do I want to play for my worker placement and which cards do I want to save for the end of this round um, for combat and or acquiring new cards. And so every round you have that hand management decision. And that's why I thought it was eligible for this list. And it's a game that I love. So I wanted to put it really high up on this list. Uh, so that's why I put Dune Imperium at number two on my hand management list. And last, I have the game that embraces all sorts of hand management decisions. And that is, and this is the game that Red Rising was inspired by. And that is Fantasy Realms. Fantasy Realms is a game where you start out with a random hand of seven cards. No control over that. And then over the course of the game, you have to decide which cards you're going to get rid of and which cards you are going to obtain either from the deck or face-up cards that other players have discarded so that you have the best uh, hand of cards at the end of the game. So on multiple layers here, uh, levels here, you are making choices. You're deciding when to get rid of cards. You're deciding which cards to gain to add to your hand. Um, and you're deciding which combos am I pursuing for my, my hand of cards at the end of the game. Um, I think it hits like it, every checkpoint of a hand management game. And it's, it's such a tight little filler game. It doesn't take long to play, but you feel so good, or at least I feel so good when I play Fantasy Realms because I, in such a short amount of time, I get to create all these powerful combos or try to create these powerful combos um, that, that pay off at the end of the game or don't pay off. Sometimes it doesn't pay off, but usually there is still a satisfying feel of creating some sort of a combo at the end of the game based on cards you acquired, cards you kept. Um, cards you pursued, or cards that you got rid of because they were going to cost you. Some cards have penalties in this game if they're in your hand combined with other cards in your hand. So that's why Fantasy Realms is my number game, number one game on this list. I'd love to hear your thoughts, and feel free to differ with my definition of hand management, but maybe for the sake of the comments here, just so it doesn't spin off into every game that has cards in hand, um, I'd love for you to use my definition, which I'll include in the description below, for you to share your favorite hand management games with me. I'd love to hear about them in the comments below. Thanks.